And actually, um, the Chinese Orthodox Church was founded very early. It was founded back in the 17th century when Siberian Cossacks, uh, along with a few priests, um, created a settlement uh, at uh, Albazin. Yes. It's called. It's in Amur Oblast, Russia nowadays. And um, back then, the Chinese emperor considered Albazin uh, within Chinese territory. And um, most of the, so the Chinese emperor threatened, uh, well, vi threatened violence and most of the colonists left, but not all of them. And uh, a few actually stayed there and um, they created like the first Russian diaspora in, um, in China. Uh, they were called the Albazinians. Mm -hmm. And um, so they still exist. Uh, there still are uh, some like some 200 uh, direct descendants of those first Cossacks that settled there in like 1685. Uh, yeah, 1685. And uh, so yeah, that's uh, quite interesting. And they and they founded basically what became the Chinese Orthodox Church. So that's uh, very interesting. But yeah, uh, Russian Chinese contact was very limited for a while. I think the first Russian who actually reached China was uh, Ivan Pitlin. A Cossack, explorer and diplomat uh, who led the first delegation that met the Chinese emperor. But even then, it would be like 70 years until the first uh, treaty was uh, made between. Uh, the reason was mainly that there was no one in Russia who understood Chinese and there was no one in China who understood Russian because between Russia and China at that time was, uh, well, Siberian wasteland. And no one lived there. It was just empty, aside from a few nomads who would graze uh, their, I don't know, reindeer or horses or whatever uh, once in a while. And uh, so there was kind of, you know, usually along national borders, uh, there is some sort of pidgin language or whatever. But uh, there was a lot of, like, completely empty land between Russia and China. Uh, so the language barrier was really insurmountable. And that only changed, funnily enough, uh, when we got Polish Jesuits in our service. And uh, the Polish Jesuits of the Russian court were able to speak Latin to the, um, to the Jesuits in the Chinese court. And <laughs> uh, the first Russian-Chinese treaty, the Treaty of Nerchinsk in uh, 1689, was uh, negotiated completely by these Jesuits on both sides. So by, by like uh, a Polish Jesuit on the Russian side and the Portuguese and the French Jesuit on the Chinese side. So they could have uh, made up whatever they wanted. No one would have understood. <laughs> So, and, yeah. uh, um, so I, I like to add what I know about the Treaty of Nerchinsk and what led up to that. So, do you guys know the Miss Universe, uh, 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 Miss Russia, to twenty eleven, uh, Natalia Gantimorova? She yeah, is Kantimirova, actually, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she is actually a direct descendant of a Siberian uh, uh, tribesman who led to the signing of the Treaty of Nerchinsk. Because her ancestor, um, uh, her ancestor's name was Gantimur, um, which is more like a Turco-Mongol name. And, and she was, uh, his tribesmen were um, living in the north of the Amur River when the Russians of uh, Cossacks first arrived, um, because the, the Cossacks demanded they pay tribute. Um, so they then run to the Chinese side of the border. They ran to uh, the, the cross the Amur River into the Qing territory. But then uh, they were required to pay tribute to the Qing uh, em empire. But the problem is, when they cross the river to the south southern part of Amur River, there's not many fur bear bearing animals, um, and you know their their tribute to the Qing court is fur, um, so then they can't come come up with a tribute. So then they decided that Gan Timur decided to lead his people back 
into the Russian controlled territory. And then that led to the confrontation between uh, the Qing Empire and the Russian Empire because the, the Qing court demand that the, the Russian side repatriate uh, these people who escaped the, from the Qing territory. Um, and, and then that, that led to the Qing army approaching the fort that was built by the Cossacks at the Albazin. Um, and, and, and then later, um, Nerchinsk, uh, and, and that there was a back and forth, um, like a different diplomatic thread. And then, but eventually the two sides decided to demarcate the border because, uh, the Qin at the time they were having problems dealing with the Mongols in Mongolia and they didn't want the, they want Russians to, uh, they want Russian neutrality while well, the Qing could deal with the problem in, in Mongolia. So in the end, they decided to compromise. Um, and and that, that the first treaty uh, between Russia and China was signed, the Treaty of Narchinsk, which demarcated the border for the next couple hundred years. This is what I what I know. And, 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 and this is, uh, I just thought it was a, a fun trivia that uh, yeah. The, How the, did you even find out about the Russian model, Kantimirova, that she's a direct uh, descendant of <laughs> this guy? I have no idea. Is I, this public I, knowledge? Or I love I, 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 I love this uh, trivia stuff. Um, you know, I, I had a also kind of interest into the early Sino-Russian uh, contact. Mm-hmm. And, and her, um, her, she also had an ancestor... Um, uh, another Gantimor who uh, I think was uh, um, who actually came to China during the um, uh, during the during the Russo-Japanese War. He was stationed in Manchuria because they they always claim that they were related. Well, they're they're like Tungustic people, but when they mm-hmm. fled to Russia, they claim they're descended from the Manchu <laughs> imperial line, which they're not. Uh, but when he, uh, you know, but they intermarry with Russians over generations, you know, by by then they're basically white. And But he, when he came to China in, in 1900s, he uh, decided to, okay, he's going to make a family quest, uh, but with the Gan Timur of name written in Chinese, um, you know, he actually created a whole family quiz and all that. But anyway, this is just a trivia stuff. Um, but 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 uh, I thought that was interesting to throw in. I see you're crazy about Russian models and the Miss Every, Russia. Everybody, <laughs> everybody's crazy about Russian models. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked it up. I looked her up, and she's not that uh, pretty at all. She's uh, mid. She's mid, but uh, <laughs> she's pretty white. She's pretty white, considering that she's a proper Tungusid girl. So well, that's I mean, her ancestor was like Tungustic back like two hundred, three hundred years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe there's some Tungusid in her eyes, but that's that. So yeah, but the first interaction between. Uh, Russians and Chinese was a military one, right? We were fighting each other. And the Cossacks who were expanding the Russian lands fought against uh, the Chinese and uh, they were always outnumbered and they uh, tried to befriend the Tungusid people, Tungus people, and uh, make them fight against the Manchu. And uh, it went on and on and on. And uh, the Chinese then regarded this territory as the outer Manchuria, but also not many people lived there, neither from Chinese side uh, and from the now Russian side, only some Tungus tribes. Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's really interesting how Russian-Chinese relations uh, developed, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like people, a lot of people don't even know this, but, but there was like a as you say, it started with a military conflict and it was like, yeah. it was involved not just the Manchus and the Mongols and the Russian, but also Koreans because uh, the, uh, at that time, the Koreans were vassals to the Manchu Empire. And when the, the Qin troops, they encountered the Cossacks with firearms, uh, you know, because the Manchu themselves prefer bows and arrows. So, but they 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 thought they needed some uh, uh back some fire fire um you know by backup. So they had the Koreans 
keen to send some Korean musketeers to join in the <laughs> expedition against uh, the Russian Cossacks. Um, and the, the, even though they outnumbered the Russians, but the Russians had one big military advantage because uh, you know Russia being connected with the, the whole you know, Europe, they they have the acquired the technology of the Italian Renaissance fort, the Bastion fort. Um, you know, the, the, that was developed during the Italian Renaissance, during the Italian wars. Um, and I guess, you know, that, that somehow made its way to Russia. You know, Kremlin was built by, <laughs> by Italian architects. So, so they, know, they, they know how to build this Bastion fort. The, the advantage of the Bastion fort is there's no, there's no, uh, there's no dead zone. You can fire, you can cover every angle from the walls of the fort. Um, there, there's no blind spot. So for for uh, the Chinese military at that time, they never encountered such a such type of fortification. They have great trouble taking it. So they couldn't storm the fort, yeah. and the, they end up settling uh, on besieging Albazine, which took many you know many months years. Yeah, because uh, they, almost uh, well, they're yeah. It's interesting because the Cossacks inside the Albazin they're heavily outnumbered, and there were like five hundred of them, yeah. and um, two thousand uh, with change of uh, Manchu and Korean cannoneers, and one of the uh, Korean cannoneer was the ancestor of Victor Tsui, Victor Tsui probably. <laughs> so that's crazy. When I encountered the, the story of Albazin. This is crazy stuff. The, uh, although they lost in the end, of course, they were heavily outnumbered. And when the, uh, the Albazin was uh, surrendered, like half of them were starved to death or had scurvy or had wounds. And, uh, uh, and they s- existed without any real supply routes uh, deep inside the far, e- far eastern Amur wilderness. And um, yeah. So not a great start of relations overall, <laughs> but maybe it's natural. Yeah, but but we had the advantage, as I said, that it was a kind of a wasteland in between Russia and China. So Russia didn't have the logistics to send a serious military force to confront China. And the Chinese didn't have any interest in sending large numbers of soldiers into, I don't know, into the taiga either. So both sides basically decided that it's better to just trade. I mean, one of the things that drove kind of the Russian expansion eastward is also the pursuit of like fur, fur, you know, like uh, fur trade. And China at that time, after the Manchu takeover, became one of the world's lar- wor- world's largest market for fur because Manchus they came from the very cold place of Manchu, like the Han Chinese actually don't wear fur before that. But the, when the Manchus came out of Manchuria, you know, wearing fur is part of their culture and they introduced that all over China. And suddenly China became one of the largest consumer of fur. And there was a commercial interest, you know, like the Russian uh, expansion eastward, they, they were always trying to find a trade route to China. They, you know, like they try, and finally, through this military contact, they, 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 they two sides decide to compromise, negotiate, and, and settle on making money. And, and, and then that, the, the established, this is, this is what drove them to compromise and demarcate the border so both sides can settle down to do business. And, and Russia, I think, was the first European country to maintain an embassy in Beijing. You know, back then, British and Dutch, they weren't allowed to maintain an embassy in Beijing. Yeah, it is, uh, in general, uh, Russian-Chinese relations were different from the relations China had with other uh, European powers. um, Because, for one, um, usually the relationships between China and, like, uh, the Netherlands and Portugal and so on were done by the monarchs. So basically, the Chinese emperor would sign treaties with um, the that were signed by the monarchs of European countries. But uh, Chinese and Russian relations, um, they were well basically by the civil service. So in in China, I think I don't know what I don't remember what it was called. Something like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Russian uh, government senate. So it was much more administrative than, and it had uh, less uh, 
less of all the the diplomatic gravitas that would uh, usually make uh, diplomacy more difficult. I think because also because of the initial conflict and the the signing of treaties. So I think the the two sides have. Um, you know they, they understand there's no uh, they can't really overcome each other easily. So yeah. So so, so there's and if a- I and if if I remember correctly, also the uh, Russian Orthodox uh, mission in China yeah. was exempt from the anti-Christian persecutions yes. that were happening to Catholics and Protestants yes. in China. Yes, there's an exception made for for the Russians, and you know, like for for longest time, the Dutch and the the British they weren't allowed to maintain uh, embassy in Beijing. You know, that's that's mm-hmm. one of the things that really irks the British because they they feel like they've been treated like barbarians, and uh, <laughs> that's one of the things <laughs> they, they, they protest. Yeah, I, I mean that's what made the initial relations also difficult because the Chinese have their a uh, very particular worldview in which everyone who is not Chinese is a barbarian. And uh, so they treated the Russians basically the same as they would uh, some sort of Mongols they encountered in the steppe as, as uh, potential tributaries. And uh, yeah, so, but yeah, that, that uh, worked out much better than with other European powers. Of course, um, the Russia took advantage as well of uh, the peri- period of Chinese weakness in the 19th century. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we we got a border sometime in the mid-19th century. Yeah. During the Opium War, like, Russia plays this, yeah. plays this, because actually at the time was uh, the Second Opium War when uh, the Anglo-French forces that occupied Beijing and burned down the Summer Palace. And uh, the Russian em- yeah, oh, and oh, the, the Russian ambassador offered to be a mediator between the British, French, and the Chinese with the price that the China have to give up the, <laughs> the land north of Amur and east of Usuri River. And, uh, and, and at that time, the, the Chinese emperor was scared out of his mind because, you know, he had to get, get out of Beijing uh, real quick before the advancing Anglo-French forces. So he he just, uh, you know, agreed to whatever he, you know, he agreed to whatever demands made of him. So this is how the, the kind of the, the, the modern China-Russian border kind of t- took form in 18, 1860. That was when the Treaty of Beijing was signed. Then the border was settled along Amur River in the north and the Wusuri River in the, in the east. Yeah, and uh, of course, afterwards we had our own problems, and then we gave you back some territory uh, in the Treaty of Saint Petersburg. In when was it? Eighteen eighty-one, I think. Oh, oh, right. That that was uh, in a different part of uh, that's that was in the yeah, in the course. Central that Asia. In... Yeah, that's when the Central. Yeah, yeah. When because when the the Tarim Basin, the Russia after. Taking hold of Taiga, finally in the 19th century, they started to expand into Central Asia. When you know, the, when the Russian military had better firearms and and, and more organized than the than the, than the remnant of uh, Mongol khanates in the Central Asia, so they were able to uh, march in, uh, take over what's present day <clears throat> Kazakhstan, and then. Uh, border that then they start to border China on the on the western side on the western side in, in the Central Asian front, um, and this, uh, in Chi- China had the a huge Muslim rebellion in the northwest. Yeah, and and the Dungan rebellion. Yeah, and during that time, um, the the rebels, the Muslim rebels, took over the borderland area in Xinjiang. And in the Yili Valley, and particular between the the Chinese speaking uh, Hui or uh, what's called in Russian Dongan, and and the and the and Turkic Muslim, which now today is called Uyghurs, the two sides start fighting yeah. among each other, and so the Russians took this opportunity to control the entire uh, Yili Valley. Uh, but they told the Qing Empire they're just there to maintain order. And then um, in 1870s, the Qing 
move army into reclaim Xinjiang and they want Yili Valley back. And I, I think that at that time, Russia had some kind of trouble with the uh, with the British. Was that? No, that was after Crimea War, right? The, the, yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was a few decades after the Crimean War. Yeah. But uh, yes, uh, it's all, all almost led to war between Russia and China. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, yeah, then we became friends again under Sergei Vite, the Russian finance minister who was in charge of East Asia policy. Yes, yes. Then we had uh, because uh, after the first war you guys had with Japan. Y- yes, yes. So, so, so um, this. Sergey, uh, how do you say his name, Sir Sergey Witt? Sergey Witte. Sergey Witte. Big Surge. <laughs> okay, yeah, Big Surge. Okay, so Big Surge um, uh, uh, made an offer to the Chinese uh, viceroy Li Hongzhang that he couldn't refuse. Basically, uh, Japan was able to defeat China in the first Sino-Japanese War of 1884, uh, well, 1894 and and, and Japan was able to take over um, K- Korea and and it was threatening Manchuria uh, and took part of Manchuria, the, the Liaodong Peninsula. Um, but but Big Surge had his own plans for Manchuria and particularly the port at the tip of the Liaodong Peninsula that would be uh, known yes. as Port Arthur. So he worked out a deal with uh, the Germans and the French and he worked out the tripartite intervention where Russia, Germany, France sent warships to Japan and said, okay, you have to give up the, the Aodong Peninsula in southern Manchuria. Uh, if you don't, we're going to bomb you. And, and Japan backed down. So, so in return, uh, Japan ransomed the land of the Aodong Peninsula back to China for additional payment of silver um, and then uh, a, a big surge then offer another deal to uh, uh, Chinese viceroy Li Hongzhang say okay we will help you counter Japan uh, by constructing a railroad through Manchuria the trans uh, trans Manchurian railroad um, and then uh, you know in return we like to put a long 98 year lease on the port author, and that will allow the Russian Navy in the Far East to have a, a warm water port. Um, and, yeah. and sadly, we lost then port offer to the Japanese, but we took it back in, in 1945. Sadly, um, I mean, the the Stalin did actually a funny thing with with port offer because he, he like he he signed the treaty with Chiang Kai Shek, and then the that allowed the Soviet Navy to stay in Port Arthur in exchange for the, for uh, the Soviet Union recognizing the nationalist government. And then Stalin used the port to help the Chinese communist fight the KMT. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting case because the, the Chiang Kai, Stalin had the Sino-Soviet friendship treaty signed yeah. just before uh, the Japanese surrender. So the the, the the agreement there was uh, because 